All right, one more video on arc length, which is 6.4 in our book. What I want to talk about in this video is what if the curve that you are given is not parameterized? All right, in the previous video, we kind of derived this arc length formula, which I've copied here for your reference, and then we figured out the length of a curve if the curve was given in the parameterized form. But what if it's not parameterized? What if down here you were just given f of x equals this as your function, and you're asked to figure out the length of this curve from, and they give you two different bounds here? Well, what you do here kind of depends. What your book tells you is, oh, there's a completely different formula. Just memorize this one. And then they give you another formula. If in fed, instead of your function giving you y in terms of x, it gives you x in terms of y. And you can memorize those three formulas, the green one, a red one, and another red one, and then you're good. I think that that's a horrible way to approach this. I think that it's much easier to completely ignore this formula in red here and just use this green formula on this problem. And you're like, wait a minute, how am I gonna use this green formula? This green formula, my variable of integration is t, right? I need x given as a function of t and y given as a function of t, so I can take the derivatives of those things and plug them in. Well, all you gotta do is take your curve and parameterize it, right? If it's not parameterized, just parameterize it, and then we can essentially be done with this video and be like, once it's parameterized, just do what I taught you in the last video. So your question is probably, okay, how do I parameterize it? Well, what I do is first, I don't like it being written as f of x. I like changing it into a y. And then you just do a substitution. Since I have y written in terms of x, if I just let x equal t, well, let's see, if x is t, then I can rewrite y, changing all the x's into t's. And these bounds that used to go from x equals zero to x equals one, now go from t equals zero to t equals one. If you look at the lines we just wrote, by doing this substitution, I ended up with two equations. An equation gives me x in terms of t, and an equation gives me y in terms of t. I parameterized the function that was given to me. If your function's ever not parameterized, then just parameterize it by changing whatever variable you have in your function into the letter t. We now have the parameterized equations in the bound, so it's easy enough to figure out the arc length. It's tempting to stop this video right here and be like, all right, I got it, we're done. I chose this example on purpose because, as I mentioned before, figuring out the antiderivative of the square root of a sum of a couple terms is really challenging. We learned a trick in the last video where we can kind of get around this by factoring and doing a u substitution. But generally speaking, antiderivatives of square roots of sums are hard to deal with. Here's another special case where you can get things to simplify nice enough so that you can figure out this antiderivative. This one, even more so than the last one, you should certainly not have thought to have done this unless somebody demonstrates it for you. So let me demonstrate it for you. If I wanna use this formula right here, I need dx dt and dy dt. I have x, so I just need the derivative of this guy. The derivative of my variable is just equal to one, and then I need the derivative of this guy. This one half is a constant, so I'll leave that alone. The derivative of e to the t is just e to the t. And then for this one, the one half is a constant and the derivative of e to the negative t, well, I'd have to use the chain rule. It's e to the negative t times the derivative of negative t, which itself is negative one. So it's negative e to the negative t. So I can just make this minus one half e to the negative t. Now that I have these two parts, I can put them into my formula here. And note what happens. If dx over dt is just equal to one, then one squared is just gonna give me this one right here. And what I'm getting for dy dt is exactly what I would have gotten for dy dx if I took the derivative of this guy with respect to x, just with a different letter floating around in there. What I'm saying is this formula is really the same as this formula, except you're changing this term into a one, which will always happen if your substitution is just changing the variable into a t because the derivative of the t just gives you this one and one squared just equals one. I'm trying to make an argument for getting rid of this formula and always just using this formula here and doing this little substitution to parameterize. At any rate, I get that my arc length is equal to the integral from zero to one, my bounds in terms of t, of the square root of the sum of dx over dt squared, so one squared, plus dy over dt squared, this mess. So if you had to integrate this and didn't have any guidance, maybe the first thing that would pop into your mind is, well, what if I got rid of these parentheses? And if you were thinking that, that's great, because that's exactly what we're gonna end up doing. To get rid of these parentheses, kind of think FOIL, one half e to the t minus one half e to the negative t times that exact same thing. Well, one half e to the t times one half e to the t gives me one fourth e to the two t. And that's because e to the t times e to the t is e to the two t. Because when you multiply two exponents with the same base, you add up those exponents. Then the O in FOIL and the I in FOIL are gonna be the same. Each of them will be one half e to the t times negative one half e to the negative t. Well, let's see, the one half times the negative one half gives me negative one fourth, but I'm gonna have two of them, so maybe negative two fourths. 
and then e to the t times e to the negative t. Well, I gotta add up those exponents. t plus negative t is zero, so I just get e to the zero power. And maybe you're like, well, isn't e to the zero power just equal to one? Yes, it is, and I'll write that in the next step. And then for the ln foil, negative times a negative gives me a positive, one half times one half gives me one fourth, and e to the negative t times e to the negative t gives me e to the negative two t power. That's already pretty challenging and we're nowhere near done, but let's keep on going. A nice thing happens if you recognize that this is just one. So one times negative two fourths is the same as negative one half. And one plus negative one half gives me positive one half. So I combine this term and this term to get this one half. And then I'm gonna leave these two terms alone for now. That gets us this far. And right now we're in great shape, even though you don't realize we're in great shape. The reason we're in great shape is because what you have underneath the radical, this thing here, it's a perfect square. I can rewrite this as something squared. And the great thing about writing this as something squared is that squared and this square root will cancel each other out and it'll leave me with something that's way easier to integrate because what's making this so hard to integrate in the first place is this radical sign. And you're like, oh, okay, that sounds like good news. What is this? this is, you're claiming this is a perfect square? What squared gives me this? Well, I think this is pretty hard to recognize. In fact, I'd argue that it's damn near impossible to recognize what it is that you have to square that leaves you with this. However, I will point out that these three terms from earlier came from this thing squared. So it's not completely inconceivable that this would be something squared because this is damn near the same as what I wrote here and this was this thing squared. So maybe we can be kind of clever. Let's see, what's the difference between this line and this line? Well, in this line I have a negative here and in this line I have a positive here, but I think everything else is the exact same because this is just negative one half that changes to positive one half, but everything else is the same. How could I make that middle term be positive instead of negative? Well, what if this were a plus sign right here? Would that work? What if I had one half e to the t plus one half e to the negative t? My claim is that this squared is the same as the line above. I don't expect you to be able to recognize that, but I think you'll find two problems in the homework where you have to recognize that something that's kind of like that, a slightly easier to form, you don't have the E's in there. But my hope was if I demonstrated this for you in this example, then when this floats around in the homework, you'll be able to do it. The point is, this is a perfect square, it's equal to this. Don't believe me? Take this and expand it out. Foil this. Let's see, one half e to the t times one half e to the t gives me one fourth e to the two t. The o and the i in foil would each be equal to just one fourth, or one fourth e to the zero power if you want. And one fourth plus one fourth gives me this one half. And then the l in foil would just be one half e to the negative two t times one half e to the negative two t. One half times one half is the one fourth. e to the negative t times e to the negative t is e to the negative two t. I recognize that going from here to here causes all sorts of confusion and I don't think you should have recognized that, but remember this little trick, it'll be useful in the homework. If we can call that good, then we can simplify this really nicely. The reason we can simplify it so nice is because the square root and the squared, informally speaking, will cancel out. Really, when you cancel out a square root and a squared, you're supposed to put it under absolute value signs, but because the parentheses will always be positive on these bounds, we don't have to worry about any of that stuff. When the square and the square root cancel out, I'm down to just here. And this will be something that's significantly easier to take antiderivatives of. Let's see, it's a sum, so I can just take the antiderivative of each term individually. This first one, one half, just to constant, leave it alone. The antiderivative of e to the t is just e to the t, so I'm done there. And then for the second one, the antiderivative of e to the negative t, it's almost e to the negative t, but if you took the derivative of this thing, you'd have to use the chain rule, as we saw before, and you'd end up with an extra negative when you took the derivative of the negative t part up here. What I'm saying is I need an extra negative down here to make sure that when I take the derivative of this, it gets me back up here. The antiderivative of one half e to the negative t is negative one half e to the negative t, and that needs to be evaluated from zero to one. Plugging in ones, I get one half e minus one half e, e to the negative one power. Plugging in zeros, I get one half times e to the zero power. e to the zero power is just one, so that's just one half minus one half again e to the zero power, so I get another one half. One half minus one half is just zero, so what I get for my final answer is one half e minus one half e to the negative one power, or if you wanna factor out the, if you wanna write this in a different format, you can. You can do all sorts of algebra, whatever makes you happy. I'm really just doing this to amuse myself. This answer was perfectly fine here. You could rewrite e to the negative one as one over e. You could then recognize, wait, I could get a common denominator here and rewrite this as e squared over e, which would take you to this form. And then you're like, well, I might as well multiply the one half through at this point and get here. There's no advantage to any of these forms over the other ones, just different ways you can write the same answer. The point of this whole example was supposed to be twofold. One, if your curve is not parameterized, 
just parameterize it. Change your variable into the letter t, that'll be one of your two equations, and then rewrite your equation with t in place of the old variable, that will be your other equation. And then two, because this arc length formula is so ugly, the thing that you have to take the antiderivative of is typically pretty ugly, so there's off so often you'll have to do some pretty clever algebra tricks to rewrite it in a form so that you can take the antiderivative. One trick that shows up a couple times on the homework is this idea of expanding a square, collecting like terms, and then recognize that what you're left with is itself a perfect square. Perfect squares underneath radicals are fantastic because the square and the square root cancel each other out, yielding something you can take the antiderivative of.